Why do? Absolutely. So for me, I went to college in upstate New York and I was from California, the Bay Area. And when I got there, A, it was culture shock. And then once you get into the winters that went six, seven months long, it was just like, man, this is a whole different world. But what I realized really early on was the competition because you had other people like myself that were going to the school because it was known as being a strong broadcast journalism school. Mm -hmm. So even just things like they called it like orange TV or something. It was like the campus television station. So you're going up against and auditioning against your classmates. And so I realized early on, like, I got to get better at this stuff because I'm going to miss out on opportunities to be in front of the camera. And they're going to put me as a producer or a writer because I'm not good as good as that person who just got that opportunity. We were auditioning against each other. This was like outside of class. It was something you would do in your free time or on the weekend or whatever. And that was like, oh man, I'm at this university where there's other students who are here trying to do the exact same thing I want to do. And I'm going head up with them now. Um, so you, you not only had competition just in terms of your own internal pride for your grades, but then also, and also <laughs> like, not only was it pride, it was, I got to get good grades because I can't afford to be here any more than three and a half, four years. Like, I got to get the heck out of here as soon as I can. Um, but then you also had the competition for some of these extracurricular activities. So that was, um, it was motivating. It was inspiring. And I'm sure, you know, we'll get into it with Carlos as well, where it's like, yeah, you could be the man at your high school, but everyone was at the, the man at their high school at this level. Now you got to step it up. And, and that's where the real competition starts, which is fun. Sure. Good to hear that. Very nice. Very inspiring, to be honest. Yes. I mean, this, this, these are things sometimes we don't hear, well, especially coming from, from, from the States, right? People have sort of different impression. Oh, you know, all seems to be cozy. Everything is mm -hmm. nice, you know? Uh, so we, we want to hear more, of course, uh, from Carlos as well. Um, so, I mean, we can, we can begin as what we plan. Yeah, absolutely. So first and foremost, I just want to thank California Metropolitan University for having myself and Carlos. Uh, my background is as a, a sports reporter and anchor. I worked in the Bay Area in Texas and then finished up at the CBS TV station in Los Angeles. I've since transitioned more to social media stuff. But along that journey, and kind of at the beginning of that journey, was my time in high school. And that's where I met Carlos Menjavar, who I know as Litos. Uh, he's a good friend from literally my freshman, sophomore year in high school. And our friendship has grown and to see what he's been able to do in his professional football career, both as a player and now as a coach and trainer has been awesome. And it's, it's been like, I've been rooting for him along the way. So he joins us now and Carlos, first and foremost, can you just tell people what you're doing right now, in addition to being a father and dropping the kids off and, and, and being the number one dad and what you're balancing right now. And then we'll get into your, your past and, and how you got to this point. I think Carlos has to. Carlos, you're muted, big dog. I, I just, yeah, guys, there you thank go. you. You're good. <laughs> I just realized what, I wanna thank you for the opportunity again. Um, and um and sharing my experiences and and what i've gone through and and my life uh, journey you know it's a uh, it's as a child you know everyone um uh dreams to to be a, at a certain place in time uh when you're in your 20s 30s and 40s but um you know reality sets in and, and you see what life's all about and the competition like kevin was saying and how difficult things are and um and it just it, it, it just puts everything in perspective as you're getting as you're maturing and you're becoming a man from a, a, a young child to a teen to a to a college student to a and to a man you know and then to a father you know there's those different layers and stages in life that you experience so at the moment right now i am uh, i am i'm living in the bay area in california um i work with um with youth players youth soccer players from the ages of seven all the way to 18 years old so my job at the moment is to um, develop young players, young athletes, 
um, help them with their schooling, um, making sure that their school is um, is is just as important as their soccer and getting them into college, um, the college um, game, you know. Um, uh, of course, not all, every kid, every child makes it there, but we all work together with a family, each family, with a club, with other coaches to get that um, individual, that the athlete into uh, college, college um, soccer, right? So that's what I'm doing right now. And so this webinar, talk, conversation, whatever you want to call it, is really has to do with coaching and, and mentoring in sports and how we can apply that to business and, and different careers. And I think one of the things that I've seen as a, as a sports reporter of late, whether it be in media or in the actual coaching ranks, is there's been this shift of we are going to give former, not give, former athletes are going to earn spots as coaches, as commentators. And a lot of times, Carlos, your guys' voices now, athletes, former athletes who've, who've played the game at the highest level, your guys' voices, and rightfully so, are being rewarded and rewarded through your own hard work. But I think your guys are finally getting the credit that has been overdue for a long time, which is you play at the highest level, you, you know the game at the highest level. And that's not to say that great coaches and great sports reporters don't know the game at the highest level. But I think there's been this, this healthy shift to, um, to players like yourself, played at the highest level and, and now you're coaching and you're able to, to pass on these nuggets and, and in a way that's relatable to the player and easier to digest. And they call them players coaches. And, and I think for, for me, from the outside looking in, I want to know from you, like, how you feel your voice is able to resonate with athletes better because you played at the highest level and you truly, truly know what they're going through. Well, at the, at the beginning, it was uh, not an easy transition for me um, from player, from being an athlete to um, taking the coach's role. Because as you know, um, as a player, you're expected to be perfect. You're expected, you're expecting your teammates to be perfect. Um, you're preparing throughout the week um, to do everything a certain way. So um, the outcome's a positive one for everybody. Um, and now I had to shift and take a step back and say, uh, I am not coaching, I'm not playing with professionals. I'm not dealing with adults, mm -hmm. I'm dealing with children. So now it's like, now I have to, you know, kind of take a step back and say, hey, lower my expectations, um, be patient with the children, um, start, at a, start at a level where they're going to understand things and then slowly progress as they're learning, right? So it's just like in school, you know, you have to start from your ABCs and then you slowly progress and then you, you, um, you see where you see the the outcome of the learning is in the game on the weekend right when they're in full competition so for me um that's always been the joy is to see children improve and also see um you know their overall progression from seven years old to 12 from 12 to 17 18 years old when they're about to graduate to uh, go to college so you know it was always um I would always reflect on myself and say, Hey, am I doing the right things? You know, am I, am I teaching the right things? Um, am I communicating enough to the parents? Am I communicating enough to the children? So those are things that as for me as a coach, I have become better at um, through time because um, if you don't reflect on what the, the th things you have to improve on, then you don't, uh, you don't really improve as a coach. Right. Because, everything goes together, you know, the teaching, the communication, the consistency, um, the planification throughout, it's all, it all comes together. And then if you miss a step or you skip a step, then you have to go back and you have to start over again. And, and you have to start from where that point where you think that the child needs more, right? So um, that's kind of how I take it. And I, you know, I've, I've dealt with it for the past uh, 
10 to 12 years doing this. And this yeah. is really in your bloodline. Like your dad did the exact same thing for you. Can you go back and take us back to your upbringing, uh, where that was? I know at some point you guys were in, in Vallejo, but can you just speak to the relationship that you have with your dad and, and some of those early memories of him teaching you the game? Yeah, well, you know, my father was always a, a top coach in the United States. He was um, he's well known throughout um, anywhere I go. My dad's name is 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 known, right? He's known for uh, being a fantastic um, uh, professor. He's a coach, a recruiter. Um, so he's he's his name is very heavy in the community, in the soccer community, and the soccer community is very small. Um, if you see it, um, because everyone's linked up and connected in some way, somehow. So for my dad, with my dad, um, it was always a difficult, a difficult relationship as a child because his expectations were always high. Um, mm -hmm. but, um, for me, it was like, okay, dealing with it and creating, uh, trying to make him happy. Um, but also enjoying what I was doing at the same time. And as a child, that's a difficult balance because you are trying to make someone happy that has these expectations of you, but also you, you want to make yourself happy and do and play however you want, right? Mm -hmm. But that, however, what I wanted is wasn't um, in his plans, but we had to find somewhere where, A, we find a balance. And sometimes it was, it was we collided head to head, but mo uh, most of the time that's the way it was. But at the end of the day, he was always supportive um, and he was always helping me with things that I had to work on as, a, as an athlete, you know, um, uh, and, and that's the kind of relationship that we had. Um, as, I, as I got older and I became a professional, he, he would always support me and say, you know, these are the things that you have to do. You continue to coach me as a man, you know. Um, and then uh, when I finished my career, he continued to coach me as a father, as a, as a, how to relationships, um, how to deal with parents, how to deal with your spouse, how to deal with um, situations at work because he's been through it all. And so um, he was always a great mentor. He's my top mentor. I've had a couple of mentors and, uh, you know, and during my career, but I can say that he was the most influential. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's awesome because that's something that is lacking from so many households nowadays. So mm -hmm. to hear that, I'm sure there were times where, like you said, it was really challenging because you don't have the perspective yet to understand that fully. You're just mm -hmm. dealing with a dad who expects a lot of you and you're like, man, get off my back, dude. Let me live my life. I want to be, I want to be Litos and I just want to go have fun. Um, yeah. You know, when we met, you were already coming into your own as a soccer player at Vintage High School in Napa, California, the Wine Valley for, for those that are familiar. And I remember seeing you, there was a, a couple of really good um, players on that team that was, that were a grade to two grades above you. There was, you know, Jesus Romero and, and Bernie Ochoa, and you were a younger player playing up with these seniors and juniors as like a sophomore. And you were just, you were like, seeing Ronaldo out there. It was like you would show these flashes of brilliance where we knew these other guys were like, they were still the forwards on the team and they were getting most of the opportunities to score goals. But whenever the ball was at your feet, you were electrifying. And then as I was a junior and you were a senior, that was really your team and you shine really brightly. I wanna know from, from your perspective, how playing under some really talented guys on a, in a very strong program helped motivate you to take your game to another level you're, where you kind of have to be patient, but still continue to work really, really hard. And then that transition to, okay, this is my team now. And this team is going to go as far as I take it. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Um, when I, when I got to vintage, I was a sophomore in high school and I was, um, it was my second year and they had been there you know, and it was their school and I understand that. And they were older than me, more mature. Um, and they were my friends, you know, and um, we really, really, really got along on and off the field. So for me, it was an easy transition. Um, and then I knew my role, 
you know, I knew my role as a young player. They wanted me to come in. They wanted me to feed balls and give balls to the forwards and defend and work hard and, and, and do this and that. And, um, as, as time progressed and, and, and they went on and when they went into college, um, I took over that, that role. I took over that role of, Hey, let's, I'm going to be the leader. I'm going to, let's do this. Um, let's play this way. Um, let's make sure that, you know, we have success, you know, and, and I didn't want to be the guy that's, um, took all the fame or all the glory because of, as you know, soccer is a team sport. So, um, there's a lot of players like Tyler Nelson. There's a lot of players like Lauren Brambilla, um, guys that were behind the scenes working their butts off and they did everything possible to make my life easier. So, um, you know, just like I made Jesus's life easier, Bernie's life easier, where they didn't have to defend as much. Um, but I had to, uh, and, and they, they did that for me, you know? So, um, you always, you always look back and you always like, oh, there's like, like we were saying before, there's always a progression, right? And my progression was, um, being a role, a very important role player to now being the, the most, most, uh, important player. So, um, so that, that was a great, that was just, a, that was just maturity. That was just time. And, um, and I knew it was going to happen, but it was just um, now the, the extra pressure for me, a good pressure um, and inspiring pressure because then I was free and I was free to play however I wanted to do. And, and, and that was, and, and that was why, um, you know, I had so much success is because I didn't have someone telling me do this, this, and this micromanaging what I had to do because I already knew in my mind and I already had a clear picture in my head how I wanted to play. And yeah. it was amazing to watch it. I'll never forget like just being on the sidelines watching you play Thanks. and dominate. And it was, it was just really fun to watch. Um, and it obviously paid off for you. You were able to go to San Diego state after that uh, and, and play soccer at, at a high level. And for you in choosing San Diego state, in addition to your dad, was there anybody else that helped you through that process of figuring out where I want to go play at the next level? Um, in, yeah, there, in that uh, kind of recruiting time. Yeah, there's a guy in, in Los Angeles. He's um, he's now coaching professionally in, in Asia. Um, he's one of the top coaches in the world um, now, and then his assistant. Um, now he lives in Southern California, another mentor I had, um, they saw my potential. Um, they worked with me, but they also said, Hey, these are the things you need to work on to be, get to that next level. Right. This is the things, if you want to become a pro, this is what you have to do. This is what you have to do as a person. And this is what you have to do as an athlete. So, you know, they, they made sure that the person and the athlete were together. You know, it wasn't just like mm. I was a fantastic player but a crappy person, you know? So, um, there's like, Hey, this is, this is how the way it should be. This is your, this is the way, um, uh, these are the steps you have to take to get there. So I always, uh, and they were brutally honest, brutally honest. And that's what you need is, uh, you need people around you that aren't just going to say yes, yes, yes to you, but also you want to have people around you that are going to be upfront and honest with you and tell you what you need to work on. And, uh, and and how you need to do things right so um and uh, his name is uh, Afshin Godby he, he lives in uh, Korea now I think um and he is uh he's one of the top coaches in the world um uh in in Asian football so it's it's he's he's he helped me a lot um and then he, uh, with my father you know they both helped me so that was a pretty good experience yeah. That's awesome, man. So you get to mm -hmm. San Diego State, which mm -hmm. um, for people who've never been to San Diego, there is a lot of distractions there. You have you have the beach, you have beautiful women, you have a big city. Um, there's a lot to do. You know, you're, you're right across the border from from Mexico. There's a lot that you can do and get caught up doing there. What was it about that infrastructure that you put around yourself, whether it was your coaches, your, your, your teammates, you know, your, your dad still being in your ear, some of these other coaches. Um, what was it about your bubble that helped you stay on the right path, 
um, play at a high level, and then we'll talk about where it took you after that. Well, it was never easy because I had uh, I was surrounded with by people that were in fraternities and surrounded with mm -hmm. girls that were in sororities. I was surrounded by guys that were drinking more than they were training. Um, so for me, it was like like you always have a picture, you always have a set goal, right? So you either had short term goals or long term goals, and my long term goal was to play pro. My short-term goal was to start on the team. My short-term goal was to score a certain amount of goals. My short-term goal was to train and make and get stronger, um, to become a better athlete, become a better student. Um, those were my short-term goals. So for me, it was like I had to separate, my, separate myself from those type of groups and create my own group and be a loner in some ways because I was in an environment where it was about party and fun and getting through school. And for me, it was it was more about work and about getting to a certain point, right? Whether it whether it be the first year, second year, third year, fourth year, I knew I was going to become a pro. So that was my mindset. And um, and you always have to um, you can have fun. You can, I'm not saying not, not don't have fun, but you always need to always like pull yourself back and say, hey, is this what I is this what I really want to do? Is that, what, is that what I really want to look like? Or do I want to be here um, to, to how I've thought for the past 10, 15 years, you know? So, you know, drinking here, doing this, having fun, partying is fun, but getting back to business is, is, is most important is finding that balance or, or actually like prioritizing the training more than anything, right? And the preparation. And so from there, because of that discipline and the way that you were able to focus when I'm sure plenty of teammates were up and down in terms of being and showing that discipline, uh, you propelled yourself into being a professional player and reaching that long-term goal that you had set when you set foot on campus at San Diego State. And you go to play pro in El Salvador. Um, you played in the first division from 2001 to 2010. There was a span of essentially four years where you're on the national team and, and got to reach some, and we'll, we'll kind of go through some of these, these different career achievements, but for you, first and foremost, how did you make that jump? So you, you're, you're done at San Diego state and, and now you, how did you like earn this opportunity to go play professionally in El Salvador? Well, I, Can you kind of take us through that? Yeah, my father had a, a contact back home in El Salvador. He, uh, he got in touch with the coach. The coach um, had a team, uh, one of the pro teams. I, had, I went down to train with that team for about four months, did preseason with them, trained with them. Uh, got bad news. Uh, the guy wasn't interested. The president is mm -hmm. not interested. The coach really wants you. The coach wanted me. The president didn't want to sign me for some ex- a, Y, and Z reason, A, A, B, A, X, Y, Z reason. Um, I come back home. I come back home, disappointed. Father's like, what happened? My mom's like, what happened? Mm -hmm. I was like, this and this. They're like, okay, it wasn't meant to be. So then I get a call again from a, an agent down in El Salvador. And he's, he's, he says, hey, you want to come back? I have another team for you. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, let's go. I try again. So I go back. Mm -hmm. I go to another team. Um, and I signed with them after a month, training with them for a month. So I had to prove myself for a whole month, no pay, living on a couch, um, very difficult situation. Um, and once I signed, I signed for three years. I signed a three-year contract, making very little money, working extremely hard. I didn't play for the, uh, for the first year. I didn't play at all. I sat the bench, I watched, I trained, I was preparing. I was doing really well in practice, but uh, I had to earn it. I had to earn it over time. And they were gonna make it easy for me. They were kicking me in training. They were making my life hell. They were moving my shoes from one side of the locker room to the other log side of the locker room. <laughs> um, my wallet was missing sometimes. So they didn't make, they, my life wasn't, uh, it wasn't easy. So um, when you're, they, you could, you're considered a foreigner, um, especially a young kid from the United States, 
they think that you have everything made here. They think that it's easy for you. So why are you there? Uh, so I had to prove myself. It took a year to get there. Um, once I, once I pro proved myself to them, I got called up to the national team, the youth national team. From the youth national team, we, uh, we played in the Central American games and we won the Central American games. So I was one of the key players in the, on that team. And from there, I gained a lot of respect from not only my teammates, but from the, the public, you know, from the fans. So I was, uh, I was loved. I was taken in. I was uh, um, given confidence. So as an athlete, that's what you want to feel. You want to feel accepted. You want to feel loved. You want to feel uh, cared for. Uh, so it, it was it was it was amazing uh, experience for me, you know. And then from there, we in the team that I played on the club team, I played on. We won the championship for three straight years. I went to another club because I had maxed out there in the club where I was at. And then I played for the rival club, which then I was hated because um, there was a, it was a rival club that I went to. And, um, and then all of a sudden, um, I, didn't, uh, I didn't do as well there because I wasn't happy there because I was so used to that, my first club. So I actually went back to the club that I, where I started from. And then that's where I ended my career, playing the next four or five years there. So it was, it was fantastic. So I had to try something new so I can see, you know, so I can taste something different and then experience something different. Right. So I got that for a year and then I, I had to, I had to go back and they, uh, they welcomed me with open arms again. No problem. Hmm. Yeah. So for yeah. you in that first year, when you feel like you're practicing well and playing well against these guys and showing what you can do on the practice field, but not getting the opportunity to do that in games, and along the way, guys are messing with you. They're hazing you. They're, they're putting you through stuff, like kind of the, the rookie things that you hear about in the National Football League and in the NBA, where, where guys are having to prove themselves. you got to go get donuts and pick up bags and do these different things. And for you, it was getting your shoes moved and people taking your wallet, playing, messing around with you, really. Um, for you, what gets you through that? Is it a song? Is it a, a, a book, a movie, something you read, something you hear, a relationship that you have? Like, what gets you through that really challenging time for you where you're away from home, trying to prove yourself and really, truly just waiting for your opportunity? Yeah, well, um, for me, it was more like my dad's relationship helping me, like how, how difficult it was. So if I can endure that relationship, I can pretty much endure anything. So I was like, things could only get better, you know, type of type of mindset. So I said, you know, if this is going on now, it's for a reason. And the reason being, you know, I'm new, I'm young, um, taking a spot and I need to prove myself. So um, it's either I give up or I go home or I get thicker skin and I endure and I prove to these guys that I'm better than them. So, and that's what I did. So I, there's two, two roads, you, you quit or you, or you fight. And I chose to fight. So, you know, and I was always brought up to fight. So, um, and, and everything was against me. So I, I, I chose that and, and I was glad I did that. You know, glad I didn't, I didn't turn back, turn around and leave. So. You mentioned the Central American games. Uh, you're also a, a key player on the Caribbean games. These are, are tournaments essentially that you guys that you guys won. Mm -hmm. What was it like for you where you're not just putting on a club uniform, but you're putting on an El Salvadorian uniform? This is a place that um, you know your parents' bloodlines travel back to. So can you just speak to the sense of pride and those moments of like you're in the locker room and you're putting your cleats on and you're putting the jersey on and you know how hard you've worked to get to that point. Yeah, it was, um, you know, it was never planned to, to be that way. But, you know, for for me to represent my roots was was inspiring. You know, I I told my parents, you know, this is this is crazy. I can't believe this is happening. And they're like, mm -hmm. oh, you can take it. And and, you know, and, and enjoy it and, 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 you know, take it in, you know, and, 
And I was like, okay. And, you know, I was like talking about it right now, I get goosebumps because the first time I step out of the stadium, the stadium is full, completely full, 40,000 people. And, you know, and they're, and they're all expecting you to give a 120% of yourself, you know, and more, you know, so you have to be prepared as fans. You have to prepare to give your life up on the field for, for your country. So, and there's nothing else. There's no excuses other than the rain or the field's bad or the, the ball is too hard. No, there's no excuses. Like this, the opponent has the same issues. So you have to go and you have to prove to them that you are better. So for me, it was, it was extremely like, is a big challenge. Um, and I, um, and luckily I had good people around me, you know, good players, younger guys, young guys, um, good staff that was, you know, through good and bad, they always supported me. So um, they always supported the group. They always felt like the group was um, not in one individual player was more important than the group. So that's why we had success, you know, so um, and, and, and just being together and, and, and living together for a month um, was was pretty much uh, one of the best experiences of my life and, and putting the uniform and then going on to the men's side and putting the uniform um, and playing against the United States and 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 playing against Landon Donovan playing against, you know, all these players that I used to watch growing up um, and and competing against them was was inspiring because I grew up listening to the national anthem. I grew up putting my hand on my chest and now I'm playing against my own my own country where I grew up. So it was, it was crazy. It was it was it was nuts. But it was it was one of the most inspiring times of my life is get walking out on that field with a full capacity stadium and competing at a high level. Yeah. Yeah. When, when your idols become your rivals, right? That's really cool. I didn't know that you had actually played against Landon Donovan. I knew some of the, you know, the team success and in, in so, some of the teams you played against. Um, but yeah. just hearing a name like that brings me back to a time and, and brings up images of the USA and where that, that team was at that time. And so it's, it's easy to be like, wow, Lidos was playing against these guys. It's really cool, man. At yeah. what point did you figure out and start to think about what is my next step? It's like you've been wired to think as an athlete and a player your entire life. And then father time starts knocking on the door and you start to realize like, oh, I can't play this game until I'm 80 years old. Like at some point there's going to be a transition. Do you remember a certain practice or game where it was like, oh man, I think I'm, I'm losing a step here. Um, um, and kind of how did that come about for you? Yeah, it was uh, it was a couple of in nagging injuries, you know. Um, it was over time, you know, six to six to eight months, eight months to a year, you know, just lower back injuries, tight tight hamstrings. Just I was spending more time in physical therapy than actually training. So during the week, so that's when you knew it's like it's not fun anymore. It's more of like it's taking a, a toll on my body, on my on my mind. You know, I can't sleep well. I can't rest well. So that's when I, uh, I called my dad and my mom. I said, hey, I was like, I'm ready to come home. And they're like, okay, so let's get you ready. So it's like, what's your plan? Or what do you want to do? I had no idea what I wanted to do. No idea. <laughs> so I was like, all I know is like soccer. All I know is uh, soccer pretty much. And I told my dad, I was like, hey, let me get into coaching. He's like, okay, but you have to go to school. You have to prepare yourself for that. I was like, okay. I was like, let's do it. So they signed me up for some school classes here in the United States. I took my licensing. I got my licensing. Um, and I lived with them for a little bit until I got a good enough job to support myself. And then once uh, I got my top credentials in the United States, it took about three years. Um, and then I was get, having side jobs here slowly. And uh, uh, it's good little jobs in the bay area and then once i got uh, my top license then i i i could take care of myself so i took care of myself for the for the, been taking care of myself for the past 10 years you know the first two years back were very difficult but uh family was always around so it was it was it was amazing for them to to do that for me right yeah so from you you know you mentioned getting your licensing 
and that opening doors. At what point were you able to become an assistant at San Diego State and then you move on to, to work with the Santa Clara program as well? How did those opportunities come about? And I'm assuming those happened after you were getting these, these different credentials? Yeah, well, the people that I, the, the, the actual coach from San Diego State was my coach. So he knew me. So he wanted to help me when I, when I got back. Um, because he knew I was one of the key vital guys in the program in the past and he wanted to help me. So he was grateful for me to go there, uh, going there um, and, and being part of that uh, program in San Diego. Um, and, um, and then it was, it was my, I wanted to learn a little bit more from him. I want to learn a little bit more from that level of college, which is a higher level than youth. So that helped me um, with, my future coaching, you know, and then um, when I moved back up to Northern California at the Santa Clara job, I lived in Santa Clara. I went into the office. I said, hey, I want to do this and this. Uh, can I help you? He's like, yeah, no problem. Um, these guys that I've known, they've known me for 20, 25 years. They know my father for 30, 35 years, 40 years. So it was an easy. It was easy for me to go in and say, hey, I, uh, I want to help. Um, and it was, and, and they were, and they were always welcoming. So for me, it was like the relationship with my father, with those coaches, my relationship with myself and those coaches. Um, and that always helps me to, uh, to get positions where I, where I, uh, what I positions where I wanted to get into because of, um, because of my networking. Right. So that was really important. And you mentioned networking because. And I think that's really important because as you transition from working within an organization to being your own boss, training athletes around the Bay Area, being a youth coach, I'm sure that's taken a ton of networking. Was it your plan and vision all along to kind of have your own thing and you just needed to learn different coaching and, and mentoring perspectives? to kind of craft yours? Was that the vision all along is like, I want to have my own thing. I want to train guys on my own and I want to coach teams on my own. Yeah, that was my vision. You know, you always learn from everybody. So I think it's, it's really important that even someone that is not as successful, but has been doing it for the past 30 years, you always learn, hey, can I take something from him? Can I take something from him? Can I take something from my dad? Can I take something, you know, from guys that you don't even know? that you just watch and you, you, you write down certain things they say or certain things that they look at during the game, you know? So you always learn from people that are at a higher, higher level than you. You always learn from people that um, have been doing it longer than you. So for me, it was about just creating my own style um, and then going with it, you know? So, yeah. As you made that transition, was there a point where you're like, you call your dad and you say, all right, dad, I finally understand what you were going through when you were coaching me and I'm, and I'm sorry for being mad at you or button heads with you. Was there a point where you're like, man, I, now I finally know what my dad was going through? Well, uh, until you're a father, then you finally understand what, yeah. <laughs> what, being, what raising kids is like and how it is um and doing it on a daily basis you know it's, it's not the easiest thing um and for me it's um like even i tell my wife now i'm learning from my kids now you know because you know i i've never had children until like my first i had our first child i had my first child with her when i was 36 so you know i had a late start but you know having a four-year-old daughter having a, a 10 month old baby um, and then having two stepsons, you know, kids that aren't even my blood and, and raising them is, you know, something that I take pride in, you know, 12 year old and a seven year old is trying to make them the best men they can be, you know, and, and, and giving them good examples every day. So, you know, and, uh, and, and thankfully, you know, my father helped me do that, you know, and I had other men in my life um, that I looked up to that help me mold my mold that about myself you know to become that this guy so you know and we're never perfect but you know we're always trying our best to 
to to do do our best for our family and for our kids right so yeah yeah you were recently posting uh your daughter taylor at her mm -hmm. soccer game how is that when you're able to you know, introduce a game that obviously means the world to you your whole life has revolved around it mm -hmm. and then you're out there seeing your blood playing the, the same game what's what's that like for you as a dad just to sit on the sidelines and take that in oh man it was it's 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 incredible you know it's uh <laughs> just watching her and watching her play and you know making sure that she's having fun out there it's really important for me you know it's um it's um it's really important for me to see it and for me to experience that with her because uh, you know she's uh I didn't have to tell her, you know, let's go play. I didn't have to tell her, hey, do you want to do soccer? She, it came from her. So that's more, that's really inspiring for me. And, and I feel really happy that something stuck, right? So, <laughs> so uh, my genetics or my whatever, my path, it, it's stuck. So I'm, I'm happy that she's, she enjoys it and that, you know, she's actually good at it. So um, now it's, I have to find the time to, to set aside to help her become you know a player that if she wants to become that type of player the top player right so mm -hmm. yeah and in terms of athletes young athletes that you've worked with you know you've posted a few that have gone on to play in college and that you've worked with and then they go and get the scholarships you're obviously a part of that part process and that journey for these athletes can you speak to and about some of those success stories or maybe one that sticks out for you that that you're the most proud of where it was like an athlete that either came to you or, or you found them and they certainly weren't ready yet but over the years of you working with them you were able to get them help get them to a point to where they were able to get a scholarship yeah there's um a player actually she just committed to uh, university of san diego um i met her when she was seven years old um, I had started coaching like I'm like on my third, fourth year and uh, started coaching. Um, and I, I saw the and I was watching her and I was like, there's something special about this child. And um, the mom comes up to me. She's like, you know, my daughter, you're looking at my daughter. I said, yeah, <laughs> your daughter's special. And then she's like, oh, really? I said, yeah, she's special. I was like, come have her come play train with my boys. And because she's too good for the girls. So she says, OK, <laughs> I was like, train. So then the girl comes and trains with me. She loves my training. She wants to come all the time. She wants to miss her own training to come to mine. I said, no. I said, to find a way to come to mine, but on different days. She's like, as long as it doesn't overlap. She's like, okay, no problem. So then we create a bond, right, with the child, the child's mom, um, the family. Um, and the, the child wants now, she, she wants to train every day. So I was like, what do you mean you want to train every day? She's like, oh, she wants to wake up at 7 in the morning train before she goes to school. I was like, I was like, yeah. She, I was like, how she's nine now. You know, so I met her when she's nine. <laughs> so I was like, okay, nine years old. She's intense. So I was like, fantastic. Yeah. So I was like, as long as she's gonna get up, get up early, she's like, Oh yeah, can you pick her up and take her? She's the fields like right across the street or like a couple blocks away. I was like, no problem. Like we've that's over like a year and a half, we've created like trust. So it's good. And I watched a little girl play, blah, blah, blah. She does really well. Um, and then I get a job offer in Northern California and she turns 10. Her life's almost over. She's like, um, she's like, I don't know what to do. She's like, uh, yeah. she's, you're leaving me, Carla. So a lot of the, the girl, little girl's crying. She doesn't want me to leave. Like I'm like her dad pretty much. <laughs> so then like the first two years, she visits me like every two and three months. She flies up. She comes up, trains for a week. She goes back. She gets permission from school. She does that for the first two years. I told her, hey, you got to leave that club where you're at because you're not progressing. You're not getting better. Go to a better club. Go to a better the coach. She goes. She does well, does well, does well. She gets in the national team camp. Um, she's playing for the U15 national team. Blah, blah, blah. It's fun. She doesn't make the cut to go to the World Cup, but she's still playing. She's having fun. She's doing well um and we still in touch she's going to be at the wedding i'll introduce you to her uh, in, in a week um but she's um she got offered a full ride to the university of san diego um 
about maybe two months ago, two, two and a half months ago. Hmm. Uh, all the hard work paid off, all her sacrifices driving from Temecula to, you know, Riverside, Temecula to Orange County to practice, all the morning trainings she did, you know, now she, uh, throughout the years and all the evening workouts she did throughout the years helps. So um, now she's going to school on a $75,000 a year scholarship, all paid for at the University of San Diego. And her mom's a single mom, worked at CVS, mm -hmm. um, low income. So, you know, this is her pride and joy. And she's going to do something she loves. And she's going to play at a top school in the country. And she's, mm -hmm. she's happy. So that's one of the stories that I've, I, I, I got to make an impact on this child's life and lead her and guide her through each process. And then she's in, she put in the hard work and I said, you have to put in the work. If not, you're not going to, it's not going to, it's not never, nothing's ever going to happen. So yeah. she, she listened and she did it. So, um, over the span of nine years, nine to 10 years. So yeah, it was good. Yeah. That's so amazing, man. Um, you know, I think one question that I want to ask to try to summarize all this is from being a player to now being a coach, is there, one thing that you can share with these students that you feel like is the most important thing that you want to be known for as a coach. And I'm assuming it's something that came from your time, both as a uh, being under the, the, the arm of your father and under the wing of your father as a, as a player, and then your own experiences as a player now that you've tried to bring with you as a coach and that you try to instill in your players they're like one nugget that you feel like any player of mine i i need them to understand this to the highest degree and this will help propel them to their highest potential your commitment and focus mm. yeah. if you're not committed to any if you're not fully committed to what you want to do if you don't have a plan then you won't ever fulfill that 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 goal um, you have to be fully committed to say you want to be a doctor. You have to be fully committed to that. Say you want to be the best trash man. You have to be fully committed to that. You have to prepare. You have to work, get up early to do it. You want to become a pro soccer player. You have to put in the extra hours. You have to be fully committed. Anything you do, you just have to put the extra hours. If you're just doing the bare minimum, then I don't think you're ever going to excel and be better than everyone else that's trying to get to the same point that you are trying to get to. So just being committed, putting the extra hours and being consistent doing it. So those three things I think is, is so important is um, that I tell my players is um, you have to have those three things. And those three things have nothing to do with talent. They have nothing to do with talent. It has everything to do with mentality and your mentality will take you very far, you know, and, and if you don't get there, it will open doors for you to do something along the lines of where you were, if that was your goal. So if you want to be a pro, if you didn't get there, then you are going to become a very good coach. You're going to be a very good mentor for someone else that can, that has a talent, but you didn't, that has a talent and the hard work, you know? So you're always going to, you're always going to find a way to, um, to, to impact someone else's life, you know? you know, indirectly or directly. So, yeah. Very yeah. well said. Do we have any other questions from the room? Anybody else want to chime in and ask Lito us anything? No, uh, no, I, I just had one uh, question in terms of the um, Kalitus was, um, you were managing a youth team and then your experiences from the adult uh, in terms of coaching and mentoring, when you deal with this age gap, uh, does mm. the principle change or do, do, do you have different principles in terms of coaching and mentoring? Uh, how do you deal with this age, age group? Because that also relates to everyday life as well. Yeah. For, so for the, younger, for the younger athletes, I always tend to um, keep things simple. I always tell uh, keep the incentive, but always keep it in perspective to where hey, if you, if if you want to improve, this is the type of mindset you have to have, you know. Um, and then with the older boys, as uh, it's more, very more, a lot more detailed, and it says a lot more tactical, 
instead of technical. The younger you work on technical, ball, 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 ball touches, 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 touches. With a, with, as they get older, you tend to focus more with, on overall structure, team structure, roles and responsibilities on e defense and offense, and more about uh, result. It becomes more result-based, you know? But with the younger kids, it becomes more individual uh, development, um, small group development, team development. And as you get older, 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 that's how it kind of gets, that's how it kind of looks, you know? You. So, and then it was as, as it also um, was very important because the children's parents want to be involved. You always have to communicate to the parents um, of the younger kid, ch child. So you train them to think a certain way and you train them to believe in what you're doing for their child. Because if they don't know, then there's always going to be questions and doubt. So if you get that out of the way early at a young age, then you're already um, setting the seed for them to understand, hey, this is what coach wants. I'm, I'm going to support coach because he knows better than I know, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's kind of how the approach I take with the younger kids. And then now when they're 15, 16, 17, 18, there's no more of those questions about playing time. There's no more about questions about other things that come up, right? It's more right. about now the child, the child is now mature enough to communicate for himself and ask the coach why this and why that instead of the parent doing it, right? Right. Yeah. That's such an interesting point because in American culture, you have these hovering parents that mm -hmm. in an atmosphere where they've, they've hired a trainer or, or their, their, their daughter or son is receiving coaching from either the school or a club team or whatever, there's a, there's a huge culture in, in, in American culture. You have all these parents that feel like they know better and that they're the, they're the better coach. Right. And so it's interesting lead us for you to talk about not only are you coaching and mentoring these athletes, but you also have to coach and mentor their parents. Otherwise you are dealing with this back and forth every time it's a practice or a game or whatever, you're dealing with this stuff. So you have to nip it in the bud. Like how, how long did it take you to realize like, oh, I can't just coach these kids. Like I got to actually talk to these parents too, to manage their expectations and, and coach well, the, them up. The, yeah, well, the parents always have the expectation of you communicating also, right? Because they want to know yeah. what your plan. So for me, it's like, you know, I, I communicate, I try to communicate with the parents at least once every, you know, three or four months, you know, just to set things straight. And my communication is always in the beginning. So everything's clear, right? And everyone knows expectations. Everyone knows what I want. And if there's questions, fine. There's going to be questions here and there. It's normal, right? Mm -hmm. um, because there's a lot of gray in what we do, um, gray area. Um, and I like to be open to where, hey, parents, you can come and ask me anything you want, or players, you can ask me anything you want. You know, I always keep communication lines open. So they always love that because I'm not like the general, like, oh, it has to be my way and that's it. No, I'm always, there's always flexibility depending on the situation and, and the child, right? So, um, and, and if you're that way, but also you're strict with the kids in training, then that's a great balance because you're giving them some leeway, but also you're, you are, you are also giving them expectations that when it's time to work, that you have to give 110%, 120% of yourself. So, nice. um, and, and the parents, uh, and, and the parents know that. So it's, it's, there's a full buy-in, you know, from them. And, and I think ultimately, and, go ahead. Sorry, Lidos, go ahead. Very difficult because sometimes you're, you have to communicate with high-end executives from Google and from Stanford, from, <laughs> um, from Cisco that are top in the top of the cut of their, uh, of their company. And uh, you, you're trying to preach and tell them how to do things and what to do and what. And getting them to buy in is, is something, right? So as long as they buy in, then everyone else buys in. <laughs> so. you, you brought up the, the communication part. I, I truly agree on that. I think it's super essential. Um, just if I may add, uh, you, you, you mentioned about the uh, mindset. I, I'm, I'm a soccer fan as well. I'm an Arsenal fan. Um, 
you 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 also brought the talent. No matter how much talent you have, commitment is is important. But you see this even at the top level. You're talking about the top league in the world. One goal down, and then they just switch off. Uh, and and no matter how much the coach tries to infuse and push all this, um, there's there seems to be at one until one point of time they were really having this barrier in terms of their mindset. They just couldn't go up and fight back even that one goal. So how do you deal with that? Um, uh, I think this goes to in in any in, in anything what we do and like when you cannot change the mindset of a person or particularly your your, your student or an athlete what do you do how do you deal with it the the uh, every every player is different right so every every human every player is a different human being so they have a different world in their head so you might have to approach you know uh saka different from you know Odegaard, you know mm. because saka in descent Odegaard is danish so right. or norwegian so you have to talk to them differently Right. You have to come into the office and say, hey, can we watch this video? This and this and that. We have to fix this, you know, so right. it takes a lot more time. It takes a lot more energy. But when you're coaching high level football like that, you need staff to help you do that, uh, to help inspire and bring the, the group back up because you cannot do it by yourself. Because also so these guys, they're all millionaires. You know, <laughs> they're trying to tell them what to do every second at a time. And they're looking at you like. Off, you know but but um you know and and for arteta he's been there and done it so they're gonna All listen right. and he takes a different approaches every weekend and he makes sure that all the boy all the guys buy in well, another difficult thing is that those all those they're the youngest team in the league so mm. when they're in the league they're very immature so they don't know how to handle the certain pressures they don't know how to handle um, you know, the press sometimes. So, you know, it, it takes a lot of work. So for, for like, for me, I have an easy job compared to that guy because I deal with children and children, the parents drop them off. They, they listen and then we go. Right. Mm -hmm. But for those guys, it's like, it's taxing. Like it's an eight hour job, every 10 hour job every day at that pro level. So, um, so that's why you have, sometimes you see 10 coaches on staff because, you know, to deal with 20 prima donnas, 25 prima donnas is not easy. So, I understand. I totally understand. So, um, so it's, uh, that maybe that, that, that at some point I want to get to that level, but it's going to take some time, you know, for me, especially, um, with my children being young, I don't want to miss out on anything that they do. So hopefully, and uh, later on in life, I can get there, right? So, yeah. Yeah. No further questions from my side, Kevin. <laughs> Litos, I appreciate you, man. This has been awesome. Um, you know, on, on behalf of California Metropolitan University to have this opportunity to speak to not only a co close friend, but someone that I think we can all learn from and learning more about your individual life, but then also these really important nuggets and messages that you've passed on about coaching and mentoring, I think has been really enjoyable for me. I hope you all enjoyed watching this, whether it was in clips form or however you're seeing it on social media. Um, Lido, so I want to thank you for your time and, and then obviously to the California Metropolitan University for this opportunity to, to be a part of this. This has been really cool. So thank you for being involved and, and all of you for watching. We, we really appreciate it. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Thank Take care. You. Thank you. It was awesome. a pleasure meeting. Thank you. All right, guys. Awesome. Lead us all hit you up. All right. Take thanks, care. man. All right, bro. Bye. See you guys. Bye. Bye-bye.